Cool. So, let's start. Okay. okay, ladies and gentlemen, as our world is facing one of the largest pandemic threats nowadays, our work is really changing. It is more than crucial to develop the skills towards the building of relationship and collaboration. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome Jennifer Bonin here as our another speaker on Tesena Fest online conference. Uh, Jen is the CEO of AI App Store, uh, the company that is creating a virtual research assistant for you uh, to be your AI platform for engagement with intelligent decision-making capabilities for competitive advantage. Jennifer will discuss the skills to be in demand now and post-pandemic and do a question and answer segment that will add value to your organization at what I have seen so far. I think it will be much more. So, Jen, I think let's go. Over Perfect. To you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me, everyone. Thanks for spending today. Um, we're going to talk about, so you guys heard from two speakers this morning, and I listened to both of them, went around what are some of the things that testers can use for AI technologies and tools, and how would those potentially work in our jobs. Then we heard about voice bots. Voice is one of the fastest growing areas that we see right now, where the majority of our engagement will go through voice, and those will be the skills um, that people are utilizing in their organizations. What I want to talk about is breaking down AI and testing and what the impact, as mentioned, will be on our skills needed and what our future of work looks like for all of us. I'm going to show you some studies um, that have been done since the World Economic Forum in Davos that started in January of 2020, right before we saw this pandemic start to spread more globally outside of Asia across the world. And we'll look at there's very much consistency in what we're seeing in those studies about skills that will be needed and how we can all adapt to meet the needs of those skills. And what's interesting here is a lot of times we focus on our technical skills and what those look like and how to leverage those. But what I'm going to show you is the skills that companies and organizations are looking for are different than just traditional technical skills that we have seen in the past. You'll need those, but there's some new ones that are being added. In order to get some engagement from you today, I want to know um, and make sure we're fitting this presentation to you. Um, and your um, ability and skill level. So we're going to use this technology called Mentimeter. It allows us to do polling. So um, it's very easy to use. You just go to a browser. You type in the URL right there on number one. It's www.menti.com. -E and then you'll be able to put in the code. The code will show up on the top of the screen in a minute when I show it to you. But if that's too hard and you're not up for um, going to the browser and putting in your code, you can just hold up your phone or a device and scan the QR code. So if you scan this QR code, it will take you automatically to the polling that we'll be doing in this session. So take a second and scan the QR code. Um, to go to the polling, super easy to just scan and get there. The first question it's going to ask you is, what is your level of understanding of AI and ML? So you can just simply type in a number. This is anonymous. I don't know who said what. So it's completely safe for you to anonymously answer these polls for me. Um, it doesn't go anywhere. You don't have a login. It's very, very secure. All right, so hopefully everyone was able to scan the QR code. If not, I'll show you the site so that we can get to the first question. So I'll pull that up so that you can see it. All right, so this is our first question. Now you can see what the audience has responded so far. So we've got nine of you who have said you have a little knowledge, three with no knowledge. One person's using it in their job today. So we'll give people just a second to respond. We'll do this a couple times throughout the session, and this actually ties back to one of those skills that we need now that we're using more technology like artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, and neural networks. So again, if you joined us a little late and you're wondering what we're doing, you just go to the URL at the top here, www.menti.com. That's up at the top of the screen. The code we'll use is 8867832. 
two. So if you're able to put that in, that's how we'll use this. We're going to come back to it, so don't close this out. Um, so we've got a lot of people with a little bit of knowledge. We've got some people with no knowledge, one person using it. So we're going to go with, we're going to give everyone a basic um, definition of a few things here today. We're going to ask some more questions. This is kind of cool. You can see the results coming on the screen real time from everyone who's in this session. Um, and a lot of the folks, I think the reason we have a little bit of knowledge is you watched the two presentations earlier today too, but we'll give you a little bit more in this session. These polling technologies, if you are not using them in your companies today, are incredibly beneficial as you'll see as we use it throughout here to getting feedback instantaneously from your team. We don't know if people are understanding because we're not able to see each other all the time anymore. We're all right now looking at a screen and not seeing each other's faces. So we lose a lot of information in translation. So when we're able to do something like this, where we see it on the screen, it resonates and we learn better. We actually take in more knowledge by doing these types of activities. So that's one of the skills we'll talk about. But again, this is the QR code to do polling. Super easy, you can use this in any session in your teams and your organizations. So my agenda today, what is AI really? So what is it and why is it such a big deal right now? It's been around since the 1980s. And so it's not a brand new technology, it's just becoming more prolific in our world and we're hearing a lot more about it. So we'll talk about what it is and do basic definitions. Then we're gonna talk about some of the problems it helps us solve in our testing world just briefly because I know a lot of your other speakers touched on some of those things. We're gonna talk about what approach you can use to get started, because you wanna know how to do this and get started. We'll talk about the impact on jobs and what we see right now as the impact to jobs for testers. I'm gonna give you some resources to learn more about this. So some different places where beyond this quick 45 minute session, where you're able to go out if you choose to and take time to learn on your own some of the techniques and skills, and then we'll give you time to ask questions if you have them at the end. So what is AI? So when we talk about artificial intelligence and people will use the terms artificial intelligence and machine learning in, um, they'll um, use them back and forth. And sometimes they just sound like buzzwords. But really what's happening when we're talking about artificial intelligence, and as you learned earlier, there's different types of artificial intelligence. So we think of narrow AI, that's one of the ones we're using a lot right now. And all it means when we talk about artificial intelligence is we're not demonstrating intelligence by humans. This is intelligence demonstrated by machines. So artificial intelligence is simply intelligence demonstrated by machines instead of by humans. And the natural intelligence we have as human beings. Then when we look at machine learning, so when you drill down out of AI and you talk about general and narrow and different types of AI, what you're looking at is really just math. It comes down to the math. It's a field of computer science that uses these statistical analysis techniques to give the ability to computer systems to learn off of that data. Then we'll talk about different techniques to teach the data, right? So there's different types of learning. You'll hear people use supervised, unsupervised, Right? So you'll hear these different types of learning then that you're using the data sets and the algorithms to train on. This is where you start to also hear about things like bias. So I'm gonna give you a high level overview of what people are talking about and why that's so important to all of us as human beings right now, because this data and the way these algorithms make determinations actually impact all of us as individuals on, an, on a daily basis that we don't even understand. So I like pictures. So if I were to think about AI and ML, artificial intelligence is really that bigger picture. It encompasses all of these different techniques that we'll talk about. And then when you look at machine learning, that's the subset inside of artificial intelligence that is these individual math algorithms that are training and learning for those systems. And then if you go a little bit deeper, what you have inside of machine learning is these neural networks. So when you hear about neural networks and people leveraging those, that's that deep learning to actually go in and do the training in a deep way to get education and additional learning and insights into those machines that are doing that learning process that we're training it on. So 
why now, right? So I told you it's been around since the 1980s. This isn't new. But what is changing and what's changed at a very rapid pace in the world, quite frankly, is the access to neural networks that I just mentioned in that deep learning. So the access and the access to compute. So compute used to be very expensive and it took a lot of compute. Back in the 1980s when this was being developed at universities, what they were using was large scale computer systems with huge computer rooms storing the amount of compute required to run those types of data and algorithms through those systems. But as we see now, we're shrinking the amount of space it actually takes to house the compute that we need. What this also means is it used to be very expensive. So access to that neural networks and that compute was prohibitive. You didn't see all of those startups that you see today, like we're mentioned in one of the presentations. You've now got many different companies who have access to these neural networks, these different approaches that have been proven out now over years. And we've learned how to refine the training mechanisms and methods, as well as with a lot of the big compute that we have out there, it's a lot cheaper. So you have startups and not just large companies that are now using and leveraging AI every day in the systems that they're building and deploying. One of the things to look at, and this gentleman here is the CEO of NVIDIA, so what he's talked about is if we think about our everyday lives, software has absolutely consumed how we operate, live, work, and are in our society. We cannot go very long usually without our technology and our devices. And all of that is underpinned with software that runs all of those devices. But as you've seen with voice and some of the other things coming out, what's happening is the prediction is all of that software will literally get eaten up by AI. So AI will become the prevailing factor of what's leveraged and utilized throughout our entire lives. So instead of just software, it's now the AI that drives all of that. So that's why an understanding of it now and how it impacts us is important because more and more of this is being leveraged every single day. A lot of us don't even realize the places where this is being used. It's not just in one country or another. There are very different philosophies being deployed in different countries on how you leverage and utilize artificial intelligence and whether or not that's a choice that you opt in to being part of the things that are using AI. I'll show you a quick trailer, it's less than two minute video that I want you to see. Um, please let me know, um, Thomas or Marcel or anyone, if you guys can't hear this. I wanna make sure it's optimized for you so that you can hear the video. Um, but I'll play this video. There's a movie that came out called Coded Bias. And Coded Bias talks about the fact that unlike other things right now, I mentioned algorithms underpin AI. So what's in those algorithms is decision trees that are making decisions every day on us as humans about whether or not you get credit from a bank, whether or not you are approved for a loan, whether or not your application is moved forward for a job or a position in a company. All of these things are being determined through these algorithms. But guess who gets to determine if those algorithms are accurate or not? It's the individual companies that create those algorithms. And many of those companies know that their algorithms are only accurate for a small percentage of the population. For the rest of us, it's not always accurate. So that's the risk in this. There is no one right now who globally controls the algorithms that are being leveraged in this technology that's making impactful decisions for all of us in our lives. So the movie talks about how us as humans need to understand how algorithms operate, work, and then what the regulations around those algorithms should be. So it's not left up to a handful of people who maybe run corporations that make money off those algorithms, but should there not be some regulations or global standards around the algorithms that are actually being leveraged and utilized. So let me know if you can't hear this, but if you haven't watched this movie, I recommend, especially now during the pandemic, if you have more free time, that you check this movie out. Um, it is out on YouTube. Again, it's called Coded Bias, and I can drop the link in the channel. But let me know if you guys can hear this. If not, um, we'll fix that. Can you guys hear it? Is there any audio? Yep. Can you guys hear it? There should no, be audio. No, no, no. Okay. I cannot hear it. Uh, please try uh, up. There is a menu bar. Uh-huh. 
That's what we wanted to make sure. Make sure the video works. So let me grab the. No, no, it's it's the issue in in Teams. You can oh, allow. In Teams. You have to allow yep. the uh, the audio settings. So if you go to Teams. Yeah. I minimized it so it didn't um, cause us a big issue. Okay, so. No, if you if you, if you maybe go... Tomas, may I help? Hi, Jen. Hey, there we go. Hi, could you please share your, your pre presentation first? Yes. Oh, you, you are still sharing. Okay, cool. Go I'm up. Yep. Please go up. Go up. up and there's with, a with your mouse. With your mouse. And there should be on the top of your uh, screen. No, no, no. On the top on oh, your screen. Here. Okay, yeah. Uh, in the middle. Yeah. I'll place that into the chat. Uh, you should see this now in the, this uh, control bar on the top. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes, at there, that little control bar. Yeah. Let me see if that lets me do that. I so hope it will to... work on your Mac as well. Yeah, I have a Mac, so let's see if it works. We um show background effects. So... Uh -huh. This is always the fun part, right, of our virtual <laughs> world we live in. So I apologize. Usually it's on the top right. of your <laughs> screen. Here, let's do this when I'm sharing. Let's see. Oh, there it is. Um, let's do. If we don't see it, what I'm going to do for you guys, give control. Um, let's see. So doesn't show me how to do that. It doesn't have the one on there that allows me You're to. You're missing do. the button there, so. Yeah, do you see it? Because you can see my yeah. screen, right? I'm missing that button. So I don't have that button. So no so audio. Yeah, so no, I, I don't get audio. Yeah, Marcel, that's good. You probably gave me that not on, on purpose. But um, what I'll do for you guys is after we're done with the session, I'll drop this clip in the chat for you so that you guys can watch it. But. Um, uh, well, I'll talk through a little bit, so I'm going to play it. You won't hear it, but this is the movie. It's called Coded Bias. This was done. Um, the individual that you see there, um, she is at MIT. She's in her first year at MIT. She was working on algorithms that do facial recognition. So we just talked about voice recognition. She did a system on facial recognition. Based on how her face looks, the way her eyes are shaped, the color of her skin, it could not recognize her until she put on that white mask. When she puts on the mask, the system could recognize her. She thought maybe it was just an issue with that one piece of facial recognition. What they ended up finding is that the majority of the systems out there around facial recognition and the way they were created don't recognize almost 70% of individuals and their faces. Huge issue, right, around who are we seeing? How are we seeing them? What are they matching? This is actually in Europe. This is Liverpool. So you're seeing this in England. These cameras were mismatching on certain faces in particular. So these cameras that are on the streets are watching, trying to identify people. And when they are, what they're doing is they're picking them up and thinking they have a criminal record or that they've done something wrong, right? So it's really impactful, these systems that are being built, but the companies that are building them aren't held to a standard of how accurate those algorithms actually are in accurately detecting information right now. So the Algorithm Justice League was an organization created that spent time in the United States in Washington, D.C., lobbying to our politicians about these facial detection systems and the level of accuracy these algorithms actually have. Right, because they're again being used to determine everything about you as an individual and a person. Now, if you go to China, these systems are actually being utilized and tied to your social media accounts. So, to actually get into your social media, your phone, access any information, they use facial recognition first. That then determines everything that's happening. They're watching all of your activity inside those social media systems to determine if you should get access to trains if you should be allowed to purchase certain goods and different things in that country. So more and more we're seeing these different approaches to AI and the bias that's built into these systems will underpin for a lot of us 
what we have access to in the future, especially depending on which country you live in and the stance that your local authorities and governments take on these systems. So Coded Bias is a good movie to get you some. It's about two hours long, but it's an excellent movie on just some of the bias built inherently into these systems as looked at through the lens of researchers um, and folks at MIT. So I'll drop it in the chat for you guys later on. So what problems does this actually solve? So when Gartner and other people did research, so this is actual studies from Gartner about what's going to change the game. Right now, people understand that overwhelmingly the biggest game changers in companies right now are artificial intelligence and machine learning and data analytics. So what happens with AI and ML is a large volume of data is generated. We have statistics and information on things we've never had before. So now with all that data, we have to use it in wise ways to make determinations and understand if the data is actually accurate. So what this actually comes down to is there's so much opportunity to actually test and make sure these algorithms are as accurate as possible. The other thing you'll see is that AI gets bucketized into different groupings or areas of what it can actually tackle. So you saw some of this in the earlier session, that text validation, where you can take two bits of text, you can compare them, and you can say if it's different or the same, or if there's a defect in the text itself. That's just based on physical text. You also heard about image difference or um, getting differences on images, where you can take two images and say what's different about those two images. This is also where we get into things like deep fakes, where people are able to use AI to produce something that looks like it's real when it's not. So image detection around deep fakes is one of the areas where we're having a lot of advancement in that AI space to understand, is it a real video? Is it not a real video? Is it a real image or was it a manufactured image? And a lot of that is done by historical analysis of things and images in the photos. So when they actually see like um, a photo of someone, say, holding someone hostage and they'll hold up a newspaper saying the date. What they're actually looking at is not that. They're looking at everything else around that. Like, do you see a vehicle in that photo that isn't actually in the country that they're supposedly in? Do you see something in else in that photo that's an indicator of where you possibly are based on um, foods or things that are local to that region? That's what it's looking at in those, and it's being trained to identify those faster than our eyes can identify them as humans. Same thing with video. So video clips, instead of just individual images, now taking whole streams of video and detecting janky frames, different um, glitches in the images, all of that. And then as you just heard with voice, this goes to the audio, detecting that audio, how accurate the audio is, what the audio should be doing. So with all these audio books and um, our audio assistants like Alexa and Amazon and Google, all these audio assistants making sure that when they hear you, that they're actually hearing what happens. Because again, a lot of those systems were developed and when they were designed, they didn't take into account even the intonation or the range of voices. So there's a big push right now by Google even around audio and voice recognition for folks who have Down syndrome. So those systems weren't built for people whose voices operate in a certain way. So individuals who have Down syndrome weren't being picked up and detected by any of the voice systems. Imagine how frustrated we all get when we talk to our vehicles or we talk to our voice assistants or even Siri on our phones and they don't understand us. Now imagine being a person that the way these systems were architected, they never worked for you as an individual. It wasn't built for you. So the key here is when we look at it, what we want to do is make sure as testers that we're thinking of these things proactively, of what are the different use cases, what are the, and are we testing for all these use cases and those different personas and customers who are going to leverage these technologies and who are using these products that we're actually building. So we're going to try another poll. So I'm going to go back to the poll we did before. Um, once I put it up, it should advance you right to the next one. So this was the last one we did. I'm going to go to the next one um, in our poll system here. So if we go next one, let's see if it'll advance. Refresh it. All right. Teams doesn't love as much. There we go. What is your primary role in your organization? So again, you can go back to menti.com 
code is 8867832. You have choices here, testing, development, scrum, project management, leadership, requirements, or other. Like if you don't fit into any of those, you can put other. This helps me just understand how many of us here um, spend most of our day doing testing or if we're doing other things. We've got a few leaders, mostly testing, more leaders. So you guys can see the results again coming in. So real time, we get to see um, what our peers out there watching this session are doing. So it's kind of fun to be able to see that. Um, if you had that scanner, that barcode up, that still works, or just type in menti.com and the code at the top, 8867832. And we can see this coming in. We got one developer. Oh, good. Someone who's doing requirements and data analysis. My prediction is we will see more of those folks in the future. That is one of the key skills that are coming up is data analysis, um, data science, data analysis um, as being hugely popular. Perfect. I think we've got the majority of our folks weighing in here on our survey, but you see how this works. So now we can see the mix of folks we've got. So we'll give you a lot of things in testing, but I'm also going to touch on data analysis and development. And then as leaders, how do we help people take in these new strategies? So perfect. Good to see that we got that. So here's one of the fundamental problems, right, that we're seeing in general. We've all seen this chart before, so we won't spend a lot of time here. But the basic crux of the problem that we're all facing is there's too many things to do and not enough time. So it's impossible to do all of this by ourselves and focus all of our time just on the tasks that we're trying to engage in, right? We need some help. So what does this AI and ML do? You saw some of this earlier. One of the things it does is it quickly helps us grasp our app or our websites that we're utilizing. So humans, it takes us time to click through and understand an app or a website. But what happens with AI and machine learning is it can do that in a very expedited manner. So what you're seeing here is a website on the right. You see the different screens of the website. Then you see all those red dots on the screen. What actually happened in a fraction of a second is this bot or agent, so I'll, we'll call them bots for the sake of this presentation. Some people call them agents, they're the same thing. They're basically the AI that's running through that's been trained to look at your website or your app very quickly. Now with a lot of these companies that are out there today, they've run these apps and these websites many, many times over and over again. So it's very easy for them to do this very quickly. So this app graph visualization that you see on the left was done again in under a fraction of a second to tell you the connection points of everything on those sites. So how does this help us? As developers, testers, and leaders, if I know the interconnectivity of all of the points on that site, I know where to spend my time. This quickly gives me that risk-based analysis of where I'm going to have issues in my application or my website. The other thing here is to note is these studies are showing us, so if you haven't looked at it, the World Quality Report is an excellent resource for us as testers around what are the trends out there, what are other people doing. What we're seeing is our focus in testing shouldn't be just finding defects. It's around end user satisfaction. So if we're really focused on our end consumers, we have to know some information about those folks to know if we're doing the right things or not. So here's some of the challenges it actually helps with, right? So it can help with scale. So if we use AI to scale our testing, having the ability to run across multiple environments, running that app graph analysis I just showed you, that's hugely helpful. If it can help us go quicker, right? So if it actually helps us achieve speed, that's a good thing too. But you have to look at, is that the case? If it can help us with production alerting, seeing things that we're not seeing yet, testing for different scenarios with different data sets, comparing our competitors because we didn't have time to build that on our own before, allowing it to do that for us, and then refining those product decisions so that we're actually making decisions off of what consumers want and need, so we're actually filling that need. So these are some challenges where I would say start looking at if any of these things are things that AI could help you, that's a good place to get started inside your organization with AI. And I mentioned there's different strategies, right? So there's different strategies depending on the type of data that you have and the type of learning you want to use in your organization. So it's not just enough to say we want to use AI. You have to then break it down into what type of learning are you going to use for the machine learning that's inside of that. Am I going to use supervised learning? I have well-labeled data sets. I know what the outcome should be, and we want it to be based on known patterns. Now, the caution here is 
if the pattern you had in the past isn't the pattern you want to predicate in the future, you have to consciously adjust or adapt the pattern and that data set. The key, though, is we each have unconscious bias. So this gets too deep for just a 45-minute session, but that's a whole nother topic. Um, unsupervised, where it's unlabeled data, we ha don't know the outcome, like with the coronavirus or the pandemic, but we want to discover patterns. And then how do we use reinforcement learning where we generate data through um, actions and we're doing this reward punishment system where bots, just like children or animals, when we train them, when we get a new puppy, we're training it through reinforcement. We're training children to reinforcement. When they do something good, we let them know they did something good. When they did something we didn't want them to do, we let them know that as well. That's the same concept here. And then there are a lot of benefits. I give you these, um, again, from a source um, outside of myself, this is based on data and research, and that's all they do at Gartner. So they have researched this and said it does help us. So AI augmented development strategies are helping people in many ways around maximizing that speed, detecting and isolating those weak points I showed you in the app graph, promoting and reinforcing consistency. There are reasons why it makes sense for all of us to be using this today. Many organizations, again, are leveraging this already. If you are not, this has changed through the pandemic. So these stats, the new report isn't out. But when we see these new stats, I bet you that we're going to see these in excess of the 80% range based on the organizations and companies and the folks we've been talking to. Instead of doing everything manually, what AI does on the right is it allows us to go through and see changes that are happening on an app. Now, the app on the right is actually based on a Unity um, platform. It's based on a gaming engine, which before you couldn't write traditional automation to do. There are things that AI is allowing us to do that traditional automation strategies haven't. So when you look at AI, think of it as another layer of decision point for us. So when you're looking at a strategy and how do I get started, I think you should think of it as different layers of tools that you have to be able to do your work. The first layer being humans. Humans are our most valuable resource. They're our most expensive resource. Utilize that layer wisely. What should humans do that only humans can do and machines don't do as well? Then you look at what can I do using traditional automation techniques? That's the second layer. And then the third layer would now be these AI technologies and strategies. What do they do really well that our traditional automation isn't doing for us? But it's not a, I can only do one or the other. It's an and, I think, right now especially, of being intelligent enough as leaders to pick which strategy is going to fit the need you have in your organization. So I always say start with the problem. So start with the challenge or issue that you're having. Understand solutions. So what are my options? Should I use humans to solve this? Should I use traditional strategies and automation? Or should I be using some machine learning or deep learning strategies and techniques? And which ones? And then you build a plan around it. And then you iterate and try things just like we do with an Agile. This is just a chart to show you. And you saw this earlier. Imagine those numbers across the top are different tools that exist in the market space today to solve different problems. I don't give you the names of the tools because I don't want to bias or prejudice people against which tools are good or not good. Down the left is all the types of testing you could be performing. So imagine the different types of things you could do, and across the top is all the tools. What you see is some of the tools do certain things and not others. There's overlap in some. There's some that don't do that very well. There's very few in certain instances that do those things. But this is what needs to happen when you analyze it is what actually solves the problem I'm trying to solve and understand right now in the AI space, it may take two or three different technologies to actually solve the problem you're trying to solve because there isn't one solution that does all those components. So that's just an awareness piece as you're going down that. Then know you're going to need and have a lot of data. So when you get this data, you're going to have to figure out how to actually do something with the information it generates. So much more sophisticated dashboards and data analysis and data science is really the key to successful AI. Those go in tandem, as you saw in the research, you have to have both to be successful. This one's actually helping with product decision-making. So there's a lot of decision-making here. This is analyzing sentiment analysis across all the reviews on the app stores, and then breaking that down over time into positive and negative feedback it can also show you on a trend graph from the minute you decide to make an alteration to a requirement in your um, mobile website, your app, or your technology, how long it takes for that to actually permeate all the way through to the end consumer. 
And then this is what you get when you use it in your testing is a lot of minute data that you're going to get on screen by screen analysis of what happened, how long it took to get there, timings, all of that, much different than just traditional performance testing. And then I mentioned competitors. This is where you can see three competitors. You can run that same AI across different websites because they've been trained. Again, it's not trained just specifically on yours. They're trained in general to know retail apps, as was mentioned before. You can run across Adidas, Nike, and Under Armour. In under an hour, what you're able to see is some patterns for data to start making decisions if you choose to. So, for example, one of these companies had issues with cart abandonment. When someone would add a product to a cart, they would abandon and go to other websites. When you look at the data that was produced in under an hour using AI, what you can see very quickly is there's a reason why. One of these takes a lot more steps to get to the cart. This is all using the same scenario, by the way. So the same scenario across three companies that do relatively the same thing, they make athletic shoes, and they want to add a shoe to a cart, a very different results on how long it takes to do that, how many steps it takes, and the actual load of the website or the app on the person who has it loaded on their phone or their device. So these are things where insights are going to come more readily when we use these technologies. So will this take our jobs away? When we get down to the end point here is what this is going to come down to for all of us is we need to understand what we do well as humans and what bots, agents, and technology does well and really focus on the things we can do well and how we succeed. There's a study on the bottom of this slide that talks about the ROI and of employee engagement, especially right now with a lot of us remote, working from home, not in our offices, seeing our people every day. The better leaders can connect their teams, the higher performing those teams will be. So we have to get a lot more creative about how we're creating connections. That surveying tool I made us use throughout this presentation was to connect us. We feel more connected when we see what's happening. We know what other people are thinking. We know how they're reacting. And that's why those types of technologies are impactful. The Art of Connected Leadership on the left is actually a book that I would recommend if you have time. It talks about how with stronger relationships, we're able to get more done, especially under times of crisis or need. These aren't always the things we focus on, but what we're seeing in this industrial revolution, we're on our fourth industrial revolution. We've had these before in the past. The fourth industrial revolution of AI is called the rise of the relationship worker. What it means is for the future of work for all of us, bots will do a lot of things, agents will do a lot of things, they'll get more and more sophisticated, but we have to be clear on what future of work looks for us. It's shifting our paradigm. So pre-pandemic, the thesis is on the left, are the things that um, they had analyzed. They said through research, here's the things we see right now. But dramatically, in a matter of months, a lot of these theses had to dramatically shift to fit the new world that we were sitting in, which meant there's a lot of change in the skills and what's required. So I mentioned the World Economic Forum, and I'll show you that survey that came out in January, and then I'll walk you through to now in October, November. But this is an activity you should go back and do with your team. What are the opportunities now for technology and companies? Obviously, we went more mobile and digital overnight. Companies that had the ability to remotely deliver, to get services and goods to people remotely, instead of having to go in person, were dramatically positioned better than those that did not. Um, what can you create or envision our teams to become more focused on that product, more focused on the customer? And what skills then do we need to be able to be successful as we evolve? Those are something I would say. The good news here when we look at futurists who have been studying this, almost 90% of the jobs will get enhanced by these technologies we're talking about. So the sooner we embrace them and understand them, the better it is for all of us because they will help our jobs. If you want to see some of the jobs of the future, this is a pamphlet I recommend. It's um, one of those is called the Human Machine Teaming Manager. It's in 21 Jobs of the Future. You can Google that online and pull it down for free. Um, this is a guide around what are the jobs that are going to be around in the next few years. I wouldn't go out as far as 10, but I would say if you look for the next 12 to 24 months, 
um, at what's going to happen. We're going to shift to leading machines instead of leading people in certain organizations that have adopted this. How do we make sure the machines are getting accurate results as we go through that process? And it actually aligns well with what we do in Agile anyways here. So we want to focus on individuals and interactions when we're managing machines. We want to focus on working software. We want to focus on collaboration and responding to those changes. The machines will do a lot of the other work, but we can do a lot on the left side as humans. So a lot of what we need to focus on, which we're not, is things like creativity, collaboration, problem solving. Contextualized intelligence, taking these large volumes of data that are being generated and understanding if they're accurate patterns or inaccurate patterns. Being empathetic in situations to know when the data is wrong. That Coded Bias movie will show you there are some times when those things don't take into account factors that they can't read in the data or that weren't present in the data. So that empathy and that storytelling coming out is key and critical components. So now to the new skills we need. This was out of Davos. So LinkedIn is a tool a lot of us use. These were the top five skills for tech jobs, not for other jobs, but tech jobs. And if you look at what they're saying, it aligns to what I just showed you is what humans do better. Creativity, storytelling or persuasion, collaboration, adaptability, and emotional intelligence. This, these were the number one skills being rated on LinkedIn for tech jobs posted in January. So, and this was looking back at 2019 leading up to Davos and the World Economic Forum in January. Now let's skip ahead to April 2020. So in January, the pandemic hadn't fully taken off. We hadn't seen it across the globe. But by April, most of us were in a situation where we were in lockdown. We had shut down countries, borders, different things. Now here's what you are seeing, and this is from Forbes in April. Eight skills for post-pandemic world, leadership at the top, non-technical. I put in pink the things that would be considered technical skills, tech savvy, data literacy, and digital marketing and coding. But the other ones, if you notice leadership, creativity and innovation, critical thinking, emotional intelligence, you're getting the idea. Now let's take another one. This was now April 24th, a week later. Top skill here um, in fast companies was artificial intelligence, number one, data analytics, number three. But your problem-solving critical thinking was in there, emotional intelligence and digital and social marketing. You're kind of getting these patterns. Now, fast forward to October, October 27th, so not that long ago. These were what the six skills were that we will need post-pandemic workplace. We've been in this now for a while. Self-direction, because we're working very remotely. You need people who are self-directed. You need digital capabilities, the ability to adapt to an online world. You need empathy to understand communication management, adaptability, and motivation skills. And look at what it says here, too, that the number of skills required for a single job was increasing by 10% per year, and one-third of the skills listed, skills listed in an average 2017 job posting would not be relevant by 2021. So what that's telling us is we need to learn to continually learn. So it's not going to be just our tech skills and our hard skills, but what they call the soft skills so or the fuzzy skills that a lot of us don't like to focus on is where companies are going. That's the differentiator. The machines can do hard skills. Those hard skills and coding skills, machines over time are going to be able to do those really well. What they're not able to do is some of these soft skills. So what I would leave you with is for all of us, what I think we need to focus on and think about in our roles, especially as folks who test and test boundaries and limits in systems applications and software is how do you push those boundaries? How do you effectively push what's being done and how to do it in a new way in the future and use the skills only you as a human can do that aren't easily replicated or replaced by a machine? And those are the things we focus on. Here's a few books. Again, I recommend the pamphlet, What to Do When Machines Do Everything, and Humans Are Underrated. So those are some resources I would recommend. I'll quickly speed through to the end so that you guys can see some of these courses. These are some key beginner resources for AI. That bottom one by Andrew Ng, um, what they found, 36% of people who took his course, it just started on Monday of this last week, so just two days ago, 
started a new career after completing the courses and then got a tangible career benefit from the course. So that bottom one, I put those learning objectives down there. I would check it out. That is a good one to look at. Um, huge benefit for getting basic understanding. I'll leave my email up there. Thank you for spending time with me today. I appreciated it. And we'll leave in the chat that coded by us. I'll drop that in the chat um, window for you guys as well. Okay, Jennifer, thank you very much. Impressive presentation. Actually, I will share a screen with a question for you. We have so far uh, two questions. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> so, favorite question uh, from Peppa again. What tools would you recommend to start with uh, to be better AI slash ML tester, artificial intelligence tester? Yeah, um, Google offers auto ML, so it's um, you can download it. So I would look at that. It's free. It's, you're able to get started. What I would say, too, is before you get started, even with the tools, I think the philosophical understanding of what you're trying to do with different techniques and strategies is important, right? So it's almost like before you begin a trade, like if you're, say, an electrician or a plumber or anything, you need to know what you're trying to do before you use tools to do it. And you need to understand the concept of wiring and how electricity works and all of that. So I would recommend that everyone start with some of those basic courses like the Andrew Ng course or one of those to make sure your core concepts around what it is, how it works, the problems it solves, you understand that because then your tools are going to change based on what problem you're actually trying to solve. So I would start with a basics course and then Google Auto ML um, is a free tool that's out there that you can leverage and utilize to play with and see like that image diffing, the percentage of accuracy, those types of things. And those are available and they're, they're fun to be able to see how it works. Okay, thank you, thank you. And the second question is also quite interesting. Actually, do we have a chance, we as a testers, when AI will grown up and become mature enough? Um, a chance to, I think testers, honestly, I think anyone who can utilize contextualized intelligence, problem solving and critical thinking, um, those skills are things that it's going to take. So if you look on the spectrum of what do we do when machines do everything in that book, some of the futurists um, like Ben Pring and others, um, even in, in my own experience with companies and organizations, technology just shifts. But what we learn to do as humans is what we're really good at that humans do um, and utilize. So any of the skills that are unique to humans right now, and I know everyone will say at different rates, machines will become self, self-directed, self-guided. They'll be able to do all the things we can do. But there are some things we as humans that are innate to us that takes a really long time for a machine to learn. So I always say focus on those things and what you're good at in your role or your position and leveraging those skills in your work because those are the things that persist and last the longest. And testers have some of those skills because we're challenging boundaries. We're looking at things critically. We're analyzing information. All of that's what's important. Oh, okay, cool. So I suppose that's it. Yes. So Jennifer, thanks a lot again for your presentation, but also for the answers.